Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today we're talking about that gosh darn religious spirit. I tell you what, it's going to be an exciting episode. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. All righty, today we are talking about the religious spirit. It's going to be an exciting episode. Before we dive in, I want to remind you that Remnant Radio is an entirely crowdfunded ministry. Uh, you can give on the links in the description. Uh, both of those links are PayPal or Patreon. You can give a one-time gift there on PayPal or a recurring gift on Patreon, as low as five bucks a month. And if you give on Patreon, you get access to extra content. Uh, really cool stuff that goes up there, like our Discernment of Spirits videos. We've done one with Elijah. We've done a couple with Stephen Bancars, uh, and we do live Q&As. So lots of really cool stuff over there on Patreon. Uh, if you go over there and subscribe, it's five bucks a month to get access to extra content. Uh, but this is also the part of the show where it's pretty important that I would tell you uh, that we've got some free eBooks. So go down to the link in the description. Uh, click this book, though man may not perceive it. It's a voice. It's a book about hearing the voice of God and the different ways that God speaks. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my fellas. Hey, fellas, how you doing? How's it going? What's up? I was not sure yeah. if Miller's microphone was it, working. Miller, His mouth was open, always, but no sound was coming out. <laughs> it's always a mystery, like what Basement Boy's facial hair is going to look like. Today's Mario. <laughs> let, let, give us give us a picture of Basement Boy over there. There he is. It's pretty solid, bro. So, yeah, what I mean, what do you the, say? Uh, I'm my a, Mario I'm Luigi Mario. look today. <laughs> I mean, that right All there, right. that look is full blown inside out. You guys go look from the dad of inside out. We posted on Facebook. Same guy. Literal inspiration. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's all true. It's all true. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, let's uh, jump in. We're talking religious spirit. Uh, actually, we're about to jump in. Before that, I want you guys to know about our Monday episode. We're having Gavin Ortland back on the show. We've had him before. Check out that episode. He did an episode on which hills to die on theologically. Uh, this one, he's saying, he's talking about why God makes sense in a world that doesn't, uh, if you haven't checked out Gavin's channel or any of his books or writings, anything, uh, this guy is awesome. So, uh, really, uh, good thinker. So that's coming on Monday. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and, uh, and help us out a little bit like this video, those of you who are watching. So, uh, now let's jump into the religious spirit, uh, Miller basement boy, has actually done the research on this episode. So Miller, you're going to guide us through the religious spirit today, which, you know, makes a, a whole lot of sense since you have one. So um, can yeah. you help us out understanding the religious she spirit? Just, she just stole my joke. I was going to say, <laughs> it was a really easy episode to do research for. I just spent a lot of time studying you two. Uh, <laughs> 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 actually, it was not easy at all because there's – the word religious spirit, it's not in there. You can't find it. Uh, but but, you, there is but you can't can find, find Trinity in the Bible, YouTube. Miller. True. True, true, true. However, but there is uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So we put it together. Can we put it together? Uh, can, can we pull together pieces throughout the scripture and discern that there is such a thing as a religious spirit? What do you think, Miller? Well, I guess that remains how do we, to be seen. I think okay. I think we can certainly put together patterns of behavior that we would all consider bad religion. And is there a religious spirit behind it? Quite possibly. Uh, but um, let me give you just sort of an outline for the show today and how, how we're going to track. So um, I wanted to find out what are the popular things being said out there on the YouTube sphere and, and uh, podcast sphere. And so I've got two video clips. Well, I guess three video clips from two different uh, channels that we're going to look at. One is from Isaiah Salvador and the other is from uh, Jennifer LeClaire. And um, Isaiah and has a buddy with him in his, right? Yeah, yeah. He's got a buddy, TJ Malakangi. I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm totally butchering that name and, and forgive me for that. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how to pronounce it. But um, both of these videos in particular, they've got over 50,000 views on YouTube. So I wanted to see what, what, what was being said out there that is popular uh, find some areas of agreement, find some areas of disagreement, and then uh, tell you a couple of the things that we've seen, like from other, um, I'd say, Christian leaders that we respect. Uh, one of them was, uh, you know, our, Michael and I's mentor, Jack Deere. Another one is um, Spurgeon, 
and you know everybody that would be interesting to know what Spurgeon has to say on the topic. And so we're going to cover some of that. And then we're going to look at the biblical examples of it. Like what can we see in scripture to say, yes, there's a religious spirit or no, there's not a religious spirit. And if there is, or if there isn't, how can, how can we make that defense? So, um, and then maybe so, get into some of the religious practices. So I actually I don't know if we'll get through all of it today or not. I actually reached out to Jack Deere and asked him about the religious spirit. He said he, in a meeting, caught a photo of the religious spirit. This is, the religious spirit yes. right there. That is a photo <laughs> wow. of the oh religious spirit. If, if uh, you guys Jack Deere, your mentor, sent me that photo. Uh, 100% true. <laughs> no lying or exaggeration whatsoever. Um, <laughs> it, hold on. If you guys are listening on the audio podcast, <laughs> you've got to check out YouTube at, I don't know, like five minutes in or so. This picture is yeah. ridiculous. Put it, back, put it back up real quick, Josh. Because we really uh, want you guys to be able to identify the religious I, spirit. I've got, yeah, you really need I've to be able to take it all, all in. All right, y'all want to hear something? This is going to be this is going to be more ghosty, and uh, you'll you'll find it interesting, and you'll probably beg me to to send you the photo that I have. But uh, I was at a I was at a colloquy with Craig Keener. Actually, um, he was presenting his uh, two volume work on miracles to uh, a seminary in in, um, in Fort Worth. And there was a charismatic Baptist pastor there who told me that he got a photo of a, of an evil spirit at his church. And I was like, okay, this has got to be a joke. And he was like, no, I'm telling you it was a, it was a, an evil spirit. And so he showed me the photo and I was like, okay, that thing is creepy. Like that is, and it clearly is a photo, but you could see like this, caricature uh, it, it reminded me of like a villain in a melodrama uh and it was the creepiest thing i'd ever seen and so i have a buddy who's one of those guys who sees things and uh, i hear the story about this the story is that this church had had like 20 different pastors in its 50 year hi history and all but two of them were taken out of ministry because of some sort of sexual indiscretion oh, and so yeah. And that, it's awful history. Um, and this guy in particular was brought in, this pastor, because they're like, we think there's something demonic that's plaguing this church and causing these uh, and tempting these pastors and, and uh, you know, whatever. So anyway, uh, this guy gets rid of it. And he, he was the longest standing pastor in that church. Uh, and his long standing career was only like three, four years at the time. So pretty uh, amazing story. But anyway, he shows me the picture. I said, do you mind if I send this to a buddy of mine who's a seer and, and you know, sees angels, demons, all that kind of stuff. And he's like, yeah, sure. So I sent it to this buddy of mine and I said, hey, have you ever seen anything like this before? And he goes, first words out of his mouth were, did somebody take that picture in a church? And I was like, yeah, how did you know that? He goes, oh, those things like to hang out at churches. And I was like, what on earth does that mean? He goes, it's a religious spirit. And I was like, I don't know what to make of this. I don't know what to think. Uh, but I mean, there's no way he could have known that. There's like, sure. these guys are totally disconnected from one another. I mean, there was like that, a so. steeple and stained glass and pews in the background of this photo. So when he was like, was that taken in a church? I'm not, obviously it was like, was it on a there back was, wall or something? Yeah, there was nothing, nothing. Uh, so, and I, you know, I, I still have the picture. Well, it is, it is like but, the creepiest thing. My wife, will not let like she's like don't show that to me again ever she, well she, but the thing yeah. is so there here's a personal story of somebody saying essentially i know what a religious spirit looks like and it looks like that so right. miller or josh what do you do with this I and mean, we're going to get to the biblical evidence we're going to get to what some <laughs> yeah. other people say and all this um but but i mean I'll take you, Josh, pull you into this a little bit. What do you do with that? Would you ever teach on this? Would you ever be like, okay, folks, here's a picture. That's a religious spirit. Watch out for that. Or, or you know, I don't know, Josh, what do you do? Um, you know, I think that uh, God can reveal things to us in a plethora of different ways. Um, you know, in God speaks to us often in our experiences. You know, when I'm at a church, sometimes uh, I will get an impression about an individual. I, I prayed for uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, one time, and uh, you know, I kept thinking of my other buddy. Uh, every time I think about him, I think of my friend Cody, who has an autoimmune deficiency. And I asked him, hey man, uh, this is a weird thing. You don't look anything like my friend Cody, but every time I am around you, I think of Cody, and this happened three or four times. 
Um, he was on the forefront of my mind. And I know Cody is one that has this autoimmune disorder. Um, do you wrestle with autoimmune stuff? And he goes, absolutely. I, oh, well, he said that it's in his, his family, his family history. His brother had just died from something uh, in that space. And he was absolutely terrified by it. Um, so what happens is like, I'll be in a space. And if I have Cody come to my remembrance, I will ask a person that I'm hanging out with, hey, do you wrestle with any autoimmune stuff? Um, and then I'll just pray for them, right? So it, it's it's as if that this memory of my friend keeps coming to mind when I'm in a situation with someone who's sick in this way. Uh, is it possible that God would bring to your remembrance an individual's face or a spirit's face or the feeling of a spirit every time you get into an environment? It's certainly possible. Um, what we wouldn't want to do, though, is turn that into a doctrine and say, because God speaks to me this way and he shows me this in this specific way, this must what be what it is for all people everywhere. Uh, that's when you begin to create mm -hmm. a doctrine or a practice around a prophetic gift. Uh, when, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the scriptures are sufficient to tell us everything necessary for our life in our practice. So we look to the scriptures that's, to say uh... this is the pattern and this is the, the practice um, for these activities. Um, and we can say, hey, these things inform me. And as an individual, I can identify that God is speaking to me about this. Uh, but I'm not going to teach that as normative to all people everywhere. That's how I would do that. Interesting, Josh, that you use that as the example. And then you say, hey, we don't want to turn this into some sort of formulaic thing, That's which right. is exactly what Spurgeon is going to touch on later. And, and I've got that in the, the show notes. Are you saying that um, I agree with Spurgeon? I, I'm saying that before you even looked <laughs> at Spurgeon's teaching on it, you have taught the same thing, <laughs> sir. <laughs> <laughs> We're right here. Oh, chip, 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 yo. Um, so should we should we get into some of these video clips, or do y'all want to just tell me how awesome I am and how I'm like great men of old? Uh, yeah, Josh, you're great. Can we just talk about that for a little bit? I, just I mean, really great, I right? don't know if people want to hear it. <laughs> they, they, they already Actually, know. That. All, all things, all things are possible has a mild criticism. Uh, not really a criticism. I'm gonna count how many times Josh says space. Hey, <laughs> apparently you say space a lot. We should make a drinking game out of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, Just kidding. Yeah, on a, that is <laughs> a theological podcast. <laughs> on a theology podcast. That's a bad idea. All right. So uh, that is a bad idea. Okay. So Miller, are you ready to watch video or do you need to do some Yeah. Yeah. Show? Let's do that. Cool. All right. Let's do it. Yeah. Video clip numero uno. That demonic spirit that killed Jesus that is trying to kill the move of God in your life. We break it tonight in Jesus name and we're just believing for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit because really TJ, you know this, you've traveled, I've traveled, this spirit has infiltrated the church. What is the number one question we always get? Isaiah, my church doesn't believe in miracles. My church doesn't believe in deliverance. My church doesn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My church doesn't have or believe in altar calls. What is that? That is the spirit of religion holding back the move of God, trying to cage up the Holy Spirit and stop the Holy Spirit from moving. So guys, we're not holding back tonight. This is our broadcast. We are going after this thing violently. We are preaching revival. We are preaching awakening and we are gonna see the Lord, mark my words, dismantle this spirit in Jesus name. This is demonic and God is gonna dismantle it today in the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, man, I just feel the fire of God tonight. Not, the first thing he did was he fashioned a whip and he went and drove out religion from the temple and he restored the purpose of the temple. Religion distorts and it warps the purpose of, uh, of, of Christianity. Jesus drove that out. And then what happened? In that hour, they came to him, all that were sick, all that were blind, all that were lame, and he healed them. He restored the purpose of God on the earth, the purpose for the temple, the purpose for the, the holy of holies. It wasn't for people to come and just slay an ox so that they can, you know, entertain their own consciences and just be at ease. The purpose was that they can what? Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people will come and humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven. We don't serve an idol. We serve a living God who has real ears to hear the groanings of the prisoners. And he said, I will preserve those who are appointed to die. And that's what Jesus reinstituted. That, that is not what we are talking tonight. Tonight we are talking about a demonic power that is quenched 
and kill the move of God even today. A power that is still crucifying the move of God. And this spirit we're preaching about, it brings shame. It brings condemnation. It says the supernatural is not real. It says the power of God is not for today. It builds structures and walls that keep God from moving outside the church. It basically says God can only move in the church. God can only move at the altar. And it keeps people from living every day in the spirit. And I'm telling you, this is really, and you touch on this, TJ, the essence of religion. It's trying to contain the power of God. When Jesus, during the first week of his ministry, cleaned the temple, as we said, check out what happens. The Bible says there were people selling doves in cages in the temple. And they were literally caging up the holy spirit they were selling the holy ghost like some type of product and jesus overturned their tables now this tj is a perfect picture of the american let's let him not say american the church in our world today that's trying to contain the move of god and let me say something to you all listening you might be saying oh you're preaching strong this is good you're talking about the church down the road you're talking about the pastor of the church i go to no i'm not i'm talking about you tonight I'm preaching to you tonight because we so easily look at other people and put the blame on other people when we don't even realize we're the ones that are Pharisees. We're the ones. I'm preaching to myself tonight. We're the ones that are religious, put God in a religious framework, and Jesus goes, here's the problem. I'm getting ready to pour out new wine, and I am not pouring out my spirit in the old structure. I am not pouring out my spirit in the old wineskin. I'm a God that says, open up your eyes because i'm getting ready to do a new thing and i hear the holy spirit saying to somebody i'm getting ready to move in ways you can't even put a label on it i know tj we're broadcasting we feel god calling us to stream i wouldn't be doing this trust me if god didn't call me it is 10 times easier to preach to a crowd than it is to a camera but i know this is a new wine this is something new and all these leaders and pastors are like how do we put our finger on it how do we label that there's thousands of people getting saved getting healed getting delivered through a broadcast through a screen and there's they can't label it and god says because i'm pouring out something on new wine skin all right miller unpack some of that for us some context that people didn't get from watching that whole video yeah you caught you you pan the camera on me right afterwards i told you i was gonna do that i said i was i was setting <laughs> you up had, videos you had like a scowl know, on I know. your face i'm not used Bro, to it <laughs> it's like you have a religious spirit that was that was my grump face <laughs> i think the thing is and, and forgive me for this but the the way that that content is presented uh is culturally not necessarily like my uh preference um you know the, the it's the my shouting favorite. the zeal um and so but i understand that like that really is a preferential thing like one of yeah. the when i was in sicily preaching they were like you're not animated enough you need to be more passionate and i realized like oh, right then and there that, that that that's just a preferential thing and so i don't want to i don't want to throw uh any um negative things his way because the packaging is not my preference i do want to talk about the content itself um and especially at the very beginning and some of it i disagree with uh some of it i agree with um, and I, I agree with where he's going, like I, in some sense, what he's trying to get after. So, um, and I need to give some, some specifics about that. Cause I think there's a lot because of the things he said that were bad that we could easily dismiss and say, there's nothing good, but there is. Um, so first off he mentions, you know, if you don't believe in miracles, if you don't believe in deliverance, if you don't believe in the baptism of the spirit, and if you don't believe in the altar calls, well, that's the religious spirit. You've got a religious spirit. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Um, you know, uh, I, I'd say that first of all, like starting with the altar calls, that was something that was popularized by Finney, right? And and this is not a guy historically that I think we should follow. Uh, in that, a lot of the historians will credit Finney to being responsible for the burnover district, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Mormons springing out from nowhere. He did altar calls, and people would come forward. He would tell them that they have faith in Jesus, and their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that kind of thing. Um, but but then would leave and there was no long term discipleship that took place. And then they heard, OK, well, Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. But what Jesus and then the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, I'll tell you about that Jesus. So it's not as if altar calls somehow have a inherently biblical context. In fact, I would make the argumentation that demanding that altar calls are the only rightful way to present the gospel then becomes a law that the scriptures don't command. It becomes a burden in which you place upon 
uh, uh, believing groups. And in some sense, uh, in the sense that religious is also often be thrown around, that's actually more religious in the negative context in the way that that, that word is being spoken of. Um, so I would say that demanding that would be a wrong application. Also, maybe the baptism of the spirit. There's tons of um, churches out there that are even charismatic that don't believe that the baptism of the spirit is a secondary blessing. Now, my brothers Isaiah and, and his buddy over there, it looks like they are classical Pentecostals, which means that uh, you have to have a second blessing, a baptism of the spirit, uh, which is signed by tongue speech uh, so that you know that you've received the baptism. Uh, however, we're third wave evangelical guys who believe that the baptism of the spirit takes place at salvation. In fact, most of Christendom believes that the baptism of the Spirit took place at salvation. And like us and others inside of the third wave space, we believe that there are subsequent experiences with the Spirit and we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. So it does seem as if that there is kind of a conflation with people who don't believe in miracles, with those who don't have his view of the baptism of the Spirit, that I don't think is uh, necessarily fair or true. Um, because it's not rooted to any biblical text. Uh, I, I've talked yeah. enough. I'll toss it over to Roundtree. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lot of the same thoughts, uh, Josh. I think Isaiah's overall overarching point was these people do away with power of the Holy Spirit, and that's a demonic thing. That's a religious spirit thing. Um, and I, I think there's a point to that. Now, whether we want to call it religious spirit or not, we're going to kind of save that for the end of the episode. But at least a religious mindset, wanting to box in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I would say that that is a religious, at least mindset. I'm not going to call it uh, a religious spirit, but uh, I, I think he makes a good point generally. And uh, I would disagree with some of the the nuance between Pentecostal third wave that Josh uh, just explained. So I'm on the same page as Josh on that. Uh, and the other guy too, the the point that he made about uh, in the temple in Matthew 21, and uh, you know, hey, it's not just about slaying the ox. It's not just about your religious sacrifice. This is about prayer. So I I think they actually made us some good points. I just uh, I just wouldn't call it religious spirit personally, and we'll kind of get to the reasons for that. Here, here would be the biggest thing that I, I disagreed with out of the uh, what was said, and this was from Isaiah. And, and guys, I feel like if Isaiah is watching this, he might think we're kind of picking on him. I mean, we've kind of talked amongst ourselves. We uh, there's I, I, I don't like know. Isaiah. There's a lot that we've liked about Isaiah. I like I like his fire. I want some of that to rub off on me. But um, you know, I, I do think that the way he articulated. Um, you know, hey, they brought their doves. The doves were caged inside of the temple, and the religious spirit wants to ca wants to cage the dove, which is the Holy Spirit, to box him in. Um, I'm not going to argue that, like, well, certainly a religious mindset at least wants to box in the Holy Spirit. But can we look at this text uh, where it talks about doves being sold and they're caged as an allegory? that speaks to today, the Holy Spirit being somehow caged or boxed in. I'm going to go with definitely not. And the reason I address this thing is that I do see this in charismatic teaching, especially often, although it's not just charismatic teaching, uh, but this overly allegorical approach to interpreting the Bible. Um, what, what was the real problem in the temple? It wasn't it wasn't that they were caging birds. There were really two uh, two major problems. One was they were selling animals inside of the temple courts, specifically the courts of the Gentiles. And the Jewish people are like, eh, who cares? They're just Gentiles. But God actually intended the temple. He said, my place shall be called a house of prayer. And so the real problem, first of all, was that they would had changed the house of prayer into a place of commerce. So imagine you're going into worship this coming Sunday and you hear a bunch of like, you know, meh, you know, moo. that's going to make it kind of hard the to worship. The sound that Miller makes when the religious spirit starts flaring up, right? <laughs> that's right. So that was problem number one. <laughs> the other problem was, quote, quoting from Jeremiah chapter seven, Jesus says, you've turned my house of prayer into a den of thieves. Uh, in other words, you're stealing. So it's like when you go to a sports game and they're like, that'll be $15 for your hot dog. And you're like, what? Uh, it was actually practical for them to buy their sacrifices because they couldn't travel 80 miles from Galilee uh, to Jerusalem dragging an animal around. So it actually made it was sensible for them to buy the animals, but they they needed to do it outside the temple precinct. Number one and number two, they shouldn't have been charged exorbitantly. This is the Pharisees just being greedy. My point is, I just walked you through an exegesis of that passage. Uh, 
And it wasn't this allegorical rendering that if we take that and we start applying it to other passages, we end up becoming unhinged in our doctrine. So that's why uh, I care a lot about being overly allegorical in our interpretations. Mm -hmm. So that yeah, would be my a good, main input. A good text, I think, uh, would be found in like Matthew 12, where the Pharisees, which like the New Living Translation will translate to the religious leaders, right? Um, it'll say that they, um, th th that they spoke of Jesus and said that he cast out spirits by like the spirit of Beelzebub, right? So Jesus is performing miracles and then here comes religion saying that he's doing this by a demonic spirit. Like they're they're discounting the authentic miracle of the move of the spirit. Um, if you were going to use a text to say, hey, religion is doing this, use a text that actually says religion is doing this. Uh, Michael mentioned at the top of the show, hey, the Holy Spirit, um, you know, uh, certainly is controlled by religion people who are religious. And this makes maybe a really good point to talk about the word religion. Um, the Bible uh, does use the word religion in the New Testament about two different times, uh, and they're always positive contexts. Um, those times, like if you're in the ESV, NASB, New King James, you'll, you'll find like the text in James where it says pure religion is to take care of widows and orphans. Like religion is typically used in a positive sense, but the New Living Translation often refers to the scribes and Pharisees as religious leaders. Um, this also plays into like that, that time period within evangelicalism where we were saying things like, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship and those kinds of things. So religion contextually within our society has taken on a, a, a kind of persona that is those who want to place legalistic burdens on top of the people of God that aren't in the scriptures. Like it's one thing to say, do not lie. The law of God says so. And if you break that law, the wrath of God abides on you, right? That's that's a biblical use of law. Uh, it's another thing to say, um, because the scriptures say that you can't boil a goat in its mother's milk, you have to have an entirely separate set of pans to boil you know, milk and then another to cook goats. So um, you know, to say you can't eat a cheeseburger, th that would be an extra burden of the law uh, that the scriptures don't actually say. So the, the word religious is being used in our context for those who are placing those burdens upon you. Um, but that word, biblically speaking, with most modern translations, isn't actually a biblical concept. So it's probably so, worthy of mentioning that at this point. Yeah, you, you're actually tracking and you're jumping ahead in, our, in the notes I got uh, forward to this in particular, which is good probably gives people context. I might have might have been better to put this at the very beginning of the show. Um, a lot of this word religion has been used pejoratively, uh, and it's a recent historical phenomenon. It's not something you would have found uh, more than 100 years ago. Um, so an expression that kind of comes around in the 60s is the expression, oh, you caught religion. And uh, the idea that it was conjuring up was like, you caught a virus, you caught a cold. Like, because religion was mm -hmm. seen as, oh, no, like now you're going to be all stifled and uptight. And it, and it also sort of was popularized in a pejorative sense by the new, the, new atheist. Um, you know, when, when Richard Dawkins wrote in, uh, wrote the book, The God of uh, the God Delusion, he says mm -hmm. this religious behavior may be a misfiring and unfortunate byproduct of an underlying psychological propensity, which in other circumstances is or once was useful. So the idea that, that the idea is this, that uh, God didn't create man, man created God and man created God because at a time it was useful for the elev uh, evolution of man. But now man has evolved and doesn't need God. And so um, so <laughs> then anything with the word religion ends up being negative. Um, anyway, yeah. Mike, say yeah. And, and if I could just chime in, too, because here, here's one reason I don't like that line, like, hey, we don't need religion. We just need relationship. Hey, well, it's most certainly true. We do need a relationship with God. This is eternal life, that they may know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, John 17, 3. This is the essence of salvation, to know Jesus. Matthew 7, 23, depart from me, I never knew you. If you're not known by Jesus, you're not saved. So yes, this is the essence. This is like the nitty gritty. What it really gets down to is having an actual friendship with God, having saving knowledge of him, not just this sort of academic knowledge of some basic doctrines, but actually knowing him and being known by him. So I get that it's about relationship. However, I don't like pitting that against religion because here uh, we're in our context in America. I know not all of you are watching from America, but um, but e even more broadly in the West, we're so individualized that we tend to think in, in, in terms of like organized religion is bad. But Jesus wasn't against organized religion. 
The Bible, the New Testament, isn't against organized religion. Paul sets up elders everywhere he goes. He sets up a church order, an organization, and he writes his letters to the elders and the deacons of such and such church. There is to be an order. There is to be an organization. And there is to be an organized religion. And if we're not part of an organized religion, we're not Christian because Christianity is our religion. And so it's actually possible for me to have a relationship with God while adhering to the Christian religion. And in fact, the two are married together. So that just kind of irks me a little bit whenever, uh, uh, because I just so often hear I'm against organized religion. Well, I'm against somebody, uh, you know, going to play golf on a Sunday morning instead of going to church and saying, well, church for me is the 18th hole. Well, and, I, and I'm going to say, well, that's uh, completely not New Testament Christianity. And um, and so anyway, I that's where I, I get off on this whole religion conversation. Yeah, I am. And I agree with you uh, on all of this. I think um, you're going to see a common thread throughout this. Uh, and it's that people will use the word religion in a negative sense, and they'll use the word religious spirit for anything they dislike. And that's the tough part is when you uh, like, you'll see a couple of other things that were used in this video about new wineskin, um, how new wine is for the new wineskin and what God is going to do today is a new thing. And it's always got to be something new. And, and that's troubling to me because it's detached from historical. I don't necessarily oh, yeah. believe that, that what God is trying to do is something new. I think he's trying to uh, reinvigorate what has always been and, and keep us faithful to the historical faith. And that in the midst of that, yeah, there's new things and that he's healing a new person. He's bringing a new person to salvation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so again, with the new wineskin thing, that can be used for any pet value you have. Oh, well, the, the new wineskin is this. This is where God is pointing out the new wine. So maybe the new wineskin is you know, a prayer movement. Maybe the new wineskin is uh, an evangelism movement. Maybe the new wineskin is, uh, you know, a certain community project or a building project. And, and you can just sort of tailor fit that language for anything you personally have a vision for. And that's really not good, especially because that text has nothing to do with your pet vision or pet project. It has to do with people not fasting when Jesus was with them. Okay. So um, yeah. here's a, here's a question though. So like, Let's look at the, the re religious leaders of the day. And I'm using that as a broad category to talk about scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, religious leaders of the day. Okay. And of these religious leaders, can we agree that they were influenced and guided by a spirit to accomplish what they did to kill Jesus, to entrap Jesus, to bear false witness against Jesus, to try to murder him, to discredit his miracles? Um, can we, can we agree that there was probably a demonic spirit or Yes, no, definitively. Uh, it seems as if God kills Jesus, um, a spirit kills Jesus, and yeah, the, well, leaders, the, uh, the religious leaders of the day Judas. kill Jesus. Say again? Satan Dude. entered Judas to betray right. Jesus. Absolutely. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that, that, G, that the devil was looking for an opportune time, and he was using uh, those people to do exactly those things. Jesus would say of the, the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Right. Because uh, you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, there's something demonic that is opposing the Lord. So mm -hmm. so there's a demonic force that is, you know, Jesus goes into the temple and it's in the temples where these spirits are crying out like, what are you going to, you came early, right? Like they're freaking out. So Jesus shows up and he is responding to these leaders who are for sure influenced by a spirit. When I hear a lot of charismatic people talking about the religious spirit, what I see them doing is taking specific attributes to those who are opposing Jesus's ministry during his earthly life, taking those attributes and then attributing them as religious spirit. So the Pharisees don't want to lose their power. They want to control things. Uh, they see that Jesus is gaining a massive audience uh, because of signs, wonders, and miracles. So they, they discredit those signs, wonders, and miracles. They lie against him and bear false witness against him. Uh, you know, they try to murder him. I mean, those kinds of those kinds of characteristics seem to be, though Though I agree that it does seem as if there is extra things attached to Salvador. Like Salvador saying, hey, like new wine and no altar calls. Like, I don't see how you can see the Pharisees Sadducees and scribes and, and get those things. Uh, but the way that I typically hear most charismatics talk about the religious spirit is they're trying to find the characteristics 
of those religious leaders and saying, that's the religious spirit. Um, and we would affirm, right, that there was a spirit there, but the Bible doesn't call that a religious spirit. Thoughts, comments, concerns? Hey, you're muted. Yeah, and I, I think... I saw yeah, you I think what your we're, hands around. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think what we're getting at here is, though, when we ask the question, is there such a thing as a religious spirit? I feel like we're kind of touching on the same sort of thing as in our Jezebel conversation, which was like, you know, Jezebel, she does, you know, she, people say the Jezebel spirit manipulates people and seduces people, et cetera. Um, well, do demons influence people to seduce and to manipulate? Well, certainly demons do that. That's right. Might we call that a Jezebel spirit? I mean, maybe you do. That language isn't in the Bible, but surely there's a spirit behind that. Same thing with what people call the religious spirit. Uh, can I point to a text that says there's such a thing as a religious spirit? There's not a person on the planet that can point to a text that says there's a religious spirit because there is no text in the Bible that says that. Uh, but can we say, well, hypocrisy, legalism, majoring in the minor, straining out a gnat and swallowing the camel and camel and you know doing all the things the Pharisees did? Can we call that a religious mindset? Certainly. Is a spirit behind that? Probably. Should we call it the religious spirit? So so I think that's how it's arrived at. I, I'm not going to stand up here and call that heresy or anything like that. Ah. Um, not by any stretch. I, I don't tend to, I don't use that language because I don't see it in the scripture, but um, Agreed. that's, that's, I think how people are getting there. And uh, some people I really love and respect yeah. actually use that language. Cool. Are we ready for clip two or Miller? Do you have some thoughts on yep. there? Yeah, let's, no, let's show clip two. I've got some thoughts, but I'll save them for later. Numero dos. He wants to use you to heal people, start laying hands on people. If he wants to use you to deliver people, and this is the, this is what's crazy about religion, TJ. The people that are doing the least are shouting the loudest. It's like right. anytime a move of God breaks out, and listen to me closely, chap, religious people are like moths to a flame when it comes to a move of God. When a move of God breaks out, every religious person and their grandmother is going to try to show up in your life. You know what's crazy to me? I had... All these Christian friends, TJ, I was drinking with, partying with, and doing everything else, else with. The moment God, oh, I felt the Holy Spirit. The moment God lit me on fire, guess what? All the religious people I was partying with, all my old Christian friends, all of a sudden, they're scholars. All of a sudden, they're experts on God. When a minute ago, they were partying with me, but now that God was moving my life, oh, brother, I don't know, you're just a little bit too passionate, a little bit too radical. I want someone to write this down. Stop listening to people that are doing nothing for God. Just go ahead and tell yourself, I gotta stop allowing people that are doing nothing to try to tell them in bondage for years. One of the most idolatrous hours in the week is Sunday morning. I'm gonna tell you why. Because millions of people gather and worship a God they don't know. Worship a God they don't love. Worship a God they don't serve. And that's why Jesus said, you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say because not everyone that stands before me, Jesus said, is going to go in. They're going to say, Lord, 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 I prophesied, I did miracles, but they never knew him. And friend, listen, I've been in church after church. I've preached in over 500 churches and I've sat in churches going, Lord, these people don't know you. There's no passion. There's no desire. Religion stops you from knowing him. It lets you know all about him but never brings you into intimate relationship. And tonight we are calling you, we are, we are trumpets tonight, calling you to intimacy with God, to encountering God for real, to knowing God personally, to knowing God intimately, and not just knowing him through a pastor or a preacher. We don't want you to know him through us. We want you tonight to know him personally. So don't allow this religious thing to deceive you into thinking you know God when you have no fruit in your life no hunger in your life, no desire. We're just, we're breaking it tonight. And I already know, bro, people are getting their friend. Pastors do not want you to do what the Bible says. They are afraid that you're going to start standing up and doing what the Bible says. And so now I want to touch on this, TJ. We have a doctrine that says the gifts have ceased. And many of you are brand new believers. You've come out of this cessationist. You've come out of this idea where the gifts have ceased. Deliverance has ceased prophecy has ceased and so now we don't need the supernatural power of god if you go on youtube tj now listen we're up and coming youtubers okay we're brand new we're fresh on it god is growing praise the lord we're about to hit 82,000 subscribers shout out to jesus praise the lord right the mass majority of youtubers right now are cessationists are reformed in other words they don't believe in the gifts of the holy spirit and let me give you the verse they use 
First Corinthians, First Corinthians, thirteen ten. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and words of knowledge will become useless. This is what your Bible says. But love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, but e and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when that which is perfect comes, that which is perfect comes, then that which is in part shall be done away with. So here's what they say, and here's what they teach, TJ. This is what religion says. We don't need prophecy, the gifts of the Spirit, the move of God, the Holy Spirit moving in our lives, because that which is perfect, here's what they say, is the New Testament. Now that we have the New Testament, we don't need it anymore. But not realizing Paul is actually describing how the eternal love of God is never going to fade away, but all these other things, the gifts are temporary. So right now he goes, we all know in part, we prophesy in part, we move in the Spirit in part, but when Christ comes, we're going to know Christ in his fullness, and so we're no longer going to know Christ partially we're gonna know God fully so Paul is saying the gifts yes are worthless without the love of God but they're not useless they're gonna be useless when Christ re returns re Sorry. returns was what uh, he was gonna say I just yeah so let me let me start here with a couple of things because the there's one text or one thing he said that was a bit out of context um, and I want to bring some clarity to it he said hey pastors don't want you following the Bible uh, that's actually not what he means in a general sense. He's talking about those who are cessationist would want you praying for the sick in a church. Like that's really what he means by that. Um, and he, he's calling that the religious spirit. So if you're a cessationist, it's because you've got a religious spirit, which I, I disagree with on some level. Cause I know some cessationists that totally believe that God does miracles, totally believe they should pray oh, yeah. for the sick. Um, they just wouldn't call it a gift of the spirit. So there's there's a lot here that he's saying that I, I want to give him a fair representation. I think he's a little bit misinformed, uh, equating reformed with cessationism. Um, that's actually not true. There's a lot of reformed people, Michael Roundtree being on this podcast, uh, who is a wholehearted seeker of God's spirit and the gifts of the spirit. So uh, I just don't think he knows that. And he just sort of assumes that reformed means well, cessationist. It typically just means um, it depends on what he means by reformed. So you can use reformed in a very broad sense um, to say anyone who is Calvinistic. It would be wrong to say all Calvinists are cessationists because that's not true. When they say reformed, typically they mean like Westminster Confession or 1689. And those two movements, I mean, there are people who say they're not reformed, but historically have understood those two reformed branches as being completely cessationist by their articles. Um, yeah, so, but you I, I don't think he knows reformed. the difference, though, honestly. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. you can use re like a neo-reformed kind of, you can use it in a broader sense to say anyone who has uh, Calvinistic soteriology. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, I just don't yeah. think he realizes that. So he's speaking a little bit out of ignorance when it comes to using the word reformed and attaching that to cessationism. Yeah. That's not always the it, case. It It is true that the majority of Calvinists are cessationists, in my experience, but that's definitely not true across the board. I mean, you're a Calvinist, um, pastors of Calvinist church. You guys are ghosty. For sure. Yep. So uh, what I wanted to, uh, to ask you, Miller, was uh, when he says, like, pastors want you to not obey the Bible, and uh, is he speaking... You saw the whole clip. I didn't see the whole, like, yeah, he's long not, clip. He's not talking about... Yeah, he's not talking about just any pastor in a general sense. This is somebody who's uh, incredibly zealous, and he's doing this ad hoc, right? He's just on the spot doing his thing. So if you were to actually ask him, do you really believe that pastors don't want you to follow the Bible in a general sense? He'd go, oh, no, that's not what I meant. What I meant is right. cessationists don't want you to pursue the gifts of the Spirit. And, and in some sense, that would be a disobedience to Scripture, right? Desire earnestly spiritual gifts. And so there is an encouragement of disobedience that he's pointing out that I agree with, but the way he phrased it, it could be really quickly misunderstood. So I just wanted to bring some clarity right. to that. Well, well, so let's address the this issue of cessationism because Isaiah has talked about it now in two separate videos. I want to ask you guys, um, could it could we make the case? Because uh, first of all, we have loads of cessationist friends as well as cessationist scholars that we really highly respect. OK, so yeah. I think the last thing that we want to do is be like, hey, everybody who's different than me on this, you just you have a demon. Right. But could we make the argument that, you know what, um, Acts 1 8 says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. Might we make the point that those who theologically make the case 
that 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 certain aspects and manifestations of that power tongues interpretation prophecy healing miracles as it's portrayed in the book of acts in the new testament and in the ministry of jesus uh those who want to say like well hey a bunch of this stuff died off in the first century or after the last apostle died or at the end of the new testament completion of the new testament canon or after three or four hundred years whatever their argument is might we say you know what that seems like a, a lying spirit a demonic spirit of some kind who put that doctrine out here not saying you're demonized not saying that you're that you yourself have a religious spirit but might we say that cessationism is a demonic doctrine? What do you guys think? Uh, I'm just gonna say no. Uh, I just I think that we're wrong about things, and that happens across the board. I, I think um, when I get to heaven, um, I I know in part now, but when I see him face to face, like I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna it's gonna make sense. And uh, a lot of the doctrine that I have that I don't quite understand is gonna make sense then. Um, I mean, I think anyone who is going to be honest every theological space like I, I was we were talking to dr craig keener before we did an interview on um the why he doesn't believe in a pre-trib rapture and we were talking to him we're like hey we're going to ask some questions about this this and that and he goes great uh but just maybe avoid any questions about the millennium and i was like okay and you know any reason why and he was just like i just haven't made up my mind I mean, this is Dr. Craig Flippin Keener, okay? This is like one mm -hmm. of the, the New Testament scholars who's like, I'm not sure. And if there is room for guys to go, I don't know, at that stage of their discipleship journey, um, I think that it's well within reason to say that people that are deeply into their discipleship journey can be wrong about something. Um, so I think that we don't know everything, and I think that we're wrong about some things. Uh, I think our, it's our job to be humbled to the Holy Spirit uh, and dependent on the spirit to lead us and guide us into truth uh, by his grace. But um, yeah, I, I am not willing to say that every person that disagrees with me on the gifts of the spirit is influenced by some kind of doctrine of demons. Um, it doesn't rob us of anything in Christ's identity. It doesn't rob us anything from the Trinity. Uh, it still it holds the Holy Spirit as a person of the Trinity with integrity um, you know, still repentance, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, all of those essential Christian pieces are still present. Uh, I would still categorize it as a tertiary doctrine, but as all Christian doctrine, it still hurts the body of Christ when we do things wrongly. So anything that we're doing wrong, we should still fight for and still fight for understanding because as we do it wrong, it still hurts people. Uh, it still has an effect. So, um, yeah. it, even if that effect is robbing God of glory, yeah. um, it does something. So, uh, I think Miller, do you want to weigh in on that? Well, uh, yeah, I don't know if I could say it's a demonic spirit. Might be, uh, I don't know. I, but on some level, when you tell people the gifts are not for, are not for today, uh, then when they read something like First Corinthians fourteen, uh, where he says, "Desire earnestly spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy," you're literally going to be encouraging people to disobey that verse. And so, does it do damage? Yeah. Could it be demonic? Maybe. I don't really know if there's any way to say that. Um, I know that I disagree with it sharply. I don't think I could have an elder at my church be a cessationist um, because to me, being obedient to the scriptures would require continuationist perspective. Um, I mean, we might be able to make the argument. No, go ahead. My bad. I interrupted you. No, no, you're fine. You uh, well, uh, I would imagine likewise, you know, if you, if you take communion and you say it's just a symbol, and that's why we don't do it every week. We do it like, you know, once a year. And I'm going to go, man, that's not right. Uh, that 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 your your theology is actually causing you not to practice the Lord's Supper like we're commanded to. So, mm -hmm. the yeah, Miller, I, I think um, whenever you said it might be, uh, maybe a demon guided that. But like, I really appreciated the way you didn't like you didn't come out and say that's definitely a doctrine of demons or, or even it's definitely not. not. I, I kind of like being in that space where the scripture is silent about whether this is a doctrine of demons or not. Let's just not call it a doctrine of demons if the Bible doesn't say so. Um, I, I think I'd like to dwell in that space a little bit more and, and just simply say, I believe the scripture strongly teaches continuationism. I believe to not be a continuationist requires significant 
exegetical gymnastics in order to arrive at that position. I believe it causes tremendous harm to the body of Christ. However, am I going to say that you've been led astray by a demon or are succumbed to the doctrine of demons or that you have a religious spirit? I'm not going to say those things. I'm just going to say what my what I see the scripture teaching, which is continuationism is true and it's dangerous not to believe in it. And just leave it at that. And you would say that of all uh, doctrines, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I would. Um, so we hey, would all so agree I, that you could be wrong because of your own sin and inability to understand all things perfectly. And you could also be wrong because a demon has led you astray on literally every doctrine. Like I think I think egalitarianism is wrong. And I think that it it panders to the culture of our age. And, you know, could a demon, you know, through some kind of painful experience, really empower that belief? Sure. But I not get, I don't believe that people who hold that position. Rick are, demonized. Yeah, I don't had, think that they're demonized. Yeah, I think that's silly. Yeah. I'm OK, you. hey, let's get that. Let's get that last clip in of Jennifer McClare. And uh, and then we'll make some commentary on that and draw some conclusions. And I'm pretty sure it's LeClaire. I don't think there's an M, is there? Is it LeClaire? It's oh, yeah, there's LeClaire. There's no M. Might be, let, yeah. me, let me say one more thing before we move on. Something sure. that Isaiah Salvador said in that video was about how all of these, he's been to 500 churches and all of these people are dead. Um, I really think he's, he's operating there out of an ethnocentrism. Uh, he has a particular zeal in the way he presents things, the way he worships. And just because somebody else's disposition is not the same means that you can judge the uh, level of life they have within them. Um, much like I, I, have a di I have a discomfort with his disposition and his presentation, but I'm not looking at it and judging his heart or whether or not he really loves the Lord because of that or is just religious, as you might say. Um, I really I don't like that. Just because somebody's not dancing or throwing their hands up in the air when they worship doesn't mean that they don't have life in them and aren't experiencing joy within them when it comes to worship. Um, I, I think that would be a grave mistake to judge people's intentions and hearts based upon the outward level of zeal. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I wrote that down as well. I forgot to bring it up. Sorry. Cool. Let's, Let's do number 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 Tris. Are created equal. Well, practically speaking, here's a good example. You know, religion, the spirit of religion, doesn't like to see a woman preach, right? They would cringe, and I'll probably get some nasty emails from this video. Uh, you know, they don't like women to preach. So a man may let his wife just go and do ministry and preach and teach and pray and prophesy, and defying the spirit of religion. So he might not flow in religion in that way. But he might turn around and offer prophetic judgments and curses and just rip people apart with his prophetic words. Well, that's religion. Because the Bible says that the gift of prophecy is to edify, comfort, and exhort not to condemn, judge, and curse, all right? And that's that religion. That's that sons of thunder mentality, you know? And what did Jesus say when when uh, when John and his brother James wanted to call down fire from heaven? Remember that? When the Samaritans didn't want to let them cross through and they got mad. And they said, Jesus, you know, do you want us to call down fire from heaven like Elijah? You know, and, and, and you know, and Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. In other words, they were, they, were, they were flowing in a wrong spirit, you know? And a religious spirit is a wrong spirit. One of the earmarks of the religious spirit and really so much of it boils down to hypocrisy, you know, and that's why so many people are so turned off by the church because there's so much hypocrisy. It really, there's so much religion in the church. Well, why should there not be religion in the church? Well, there should be life in the church. See, the spirit gives what? Life. The letter of the law kills. The spirit gives life. So when we get religious, it just binds people up. It's condemning. Uh, it, it, it doesn't cause growth. It causes stunted growth. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty, you guys are smart, but have you ever noticed how you can sort of see that religious spirit or the Jezebel spirit or whatever spirit, but like the leaders around you don't see it, and like some of the people around you don't see it? Well, it's not because they're not discerning, it's because that thing hides. I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, discerned something and when the leadership is around, they're just on their perfect behavior because they don't manifest it. That's those spirits know how to hide. So don't let that frustrate you and don't be too adamant. That's why I said don't go on a witch hunt. One of your safest moves when you're discerning these things in the spirit is not to go around telling everybody because it can end up making you look bad. I mean, you might be spot on. You probably are. But you know what your response should be? Anybody? You should be praying about it. Let the Lord reveal. Let the Lord expose it. It's not your job, you know, to sort of be the lone ranger, the masked man and run around exposing everything and combating everything. Get to your knees and pray about it. Because you've probably got some religious mindsets yourself. I've probably got some religious mindsets myself, okay? So let's not be 
Hypocrites, okay? So here's the deal. You remember the woman caught in the act of adultery? It's in uh, John 8, 1 through 5. You can read about that there. You remember that story. The scribes and the Pharisees, they caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Can you imagine? And they dragged her to Jesus and they said, we have caught this woman in the very act of adultery. You know, the law says, religion says, we should stone her to death. But Jesus, what do you say? And of course, they were trying to trap him. You know, but that's not the point I want to make here. The point I want to make is, where was the man who was also caught in adultery? I didn't see them dragging him there to be stoned. And that's the hypocritical religious spirit. Okay, which oftentimes religion targets women over men anyway, and that's a whole other story. And I've written about it. You can go read about that. Type my name in Google, Jennifer LeClaire, Women in Ministry, and you'll find some articles I've written on that as well. Of course, you know, hypocrisy is not the only way that religion manifests, but it's a key way. Um, the Apostle Peter, you remember when he was eating with the Gentile believers uh, at Antioch, right? And he was pleased to eat with them, the Bible says in Galatians 2, 11 through 13. He's hanging out with the Gentiles, no problem. You know, they're all under the blood. They all have faith in Jesus. They're all brothers. But all of a sudden, you know, the, the boys from Jerusalem show up and uh, Peter's like, ah, I don't think I'm going to hang out with you Gentiles anymore. Let me go over here and sit with the Jews. Okay. Well, that was wrong. That was hypocritical. That was uh, Peter tapping into the spirit of religion or tapping into a spiritual mindset. And so what happened was Paul saw what was going on. And, you know, Paul, he's just bold as anything. You know, Paul rebuked him. He, he, the Bible says he withstood Peter to his face. He called him out on it. He's like, you know, didn't we all, you know, uh, you know, aren't we all under the same blood? Didn't we all, don't we all believe by faith? We, aren't we all justified by faith? You know, not by circumcision. And so that's the hypocrisy. But, you know, I've been focusing on the hypocrisy over and over here because that's really what I see as the core of the religious spirit or the religious mindset or the spirit of religiosity or legalism or whatever you happen to call it. It's all that same sort. OK, that one didn't go to Miller instantly. Um, guys, I have. How dare you? I have so many thoughts. <laughs> Miller, do you have any content that you need to unpack <laughs> from that clip? Uh, listen, there's a lot that she said that was really good. And I know there I know the thing we're all cringing. I mean, you saw me go. Oh, no, don't, don't say that. <laughs> um, when you when you say that all uh, complementarians, it's a religious spirit. They hate to see a woman preach. Man, that is really that is a very unfair uh, misrepresentation of those who disagree with her. Um, I, I, but the fact is when she talks about the, uh, the hypocrisy within um, the church or, or the, you know, the leaders, the religious leaders at the time of Jesus, uh, she's right. That's right. And when she talks about the woman who was uh, being brought before Jesus uh, to be stoned and she said, Hey, where was the man in that? scenario they didn't care at all about that woman about her sin they just wanted to catch jesus she became a trap and they didn't care about her dignity at all and there's a lot there that she's dead right on so i, I don't want us to be overly tag critical, me in on that uh, I because i don't yeah i don't think she's right on that well I, well i said there's a lot that she is right about in that not sure. that everything she said was right uh i just there, <laughs> there's some important things there i just don't want us to be overly uh, sensitive to something she said that we strongly disagree with. And that's a uh, very sh sharp, sharp accusation. That's all. Yeah. I was taking deep breaths over on this end and Miller could hear me. Um, <laughs> he was cracking up over there. I could see him on camera. I, I get to see more things than they get to see. Like I can see their cameras and stuff, um, but they can't oh, see me because I'm directing it. Sorry, Josh, let me just interrupt real quickly. Yeah. Why do we show this? Yeah. There's some things we disagree with, but it's got over 50,000 views on YouTube. This is a yeah. popular person, a popular voice that speaks about spirits and this particular spirit. So that's why. Yeah. And she's come up a couple of times. We've reviewed her content before. Um, okay. So the woman caught in acts of adultery, this is a textual variant. And if you're out there and you don't know what a textual variant is, just know that every conservative evangelical is aware of textual variants. I am not like some kind of liberal scholar that says this doesn't belong in the Bible. Um, a textual variant is when you go back to the earliest manuscripts, uh, this passage, this section of verses is not present. Um, and there's really well-known theologians from all over the place who will not preach this on the Lord's day. They will read, they'll preach through verses, verse by verse. They'll get to the section. They will skip over it and preach through the rest of it. Um, and they will say this verse, these verses through here, we'll read them. I'll talk about them. I'll say, hey, this is an important tradition that comes from the early church. Um, this is why it's important. This is why we don't preach through it because um, we know we when we, you talk about uh, inerrancy, like the Chicago Statement or the Fuller Statement, we're, we're talking about the original autographs. The earliest copies of the scriptures are the ones that are inerrant. 
uh, later additions to those things, we are not affirming that those things are inerrant. So um, because of that, many, many, many theologians will not preach through this text. Now, that, that's neither here nor there. The problem that I have with her use of this passage, the way she uses this passage, is she goes, stoning that woman would have been law, and that's religion. Um, that's not the way that we use the law in the New Testament. The law uh, of God is still binding on every single person, man, woman, and child, on all of us, as a exposing uh, our, our immorality, our inability to follow the moral law. Was murder wrong before Paul read that murder was wrong? Absolutely murder was wrong. Murder was wrong when Cain killed Abel, but there was no law. Uh, and because there was no law, um, didn't know that it was wrong. It's what Paul says, right? When when the law came, it revealed to me that I fell short. And the law is lawful as long as it's used lawfully. So uh, when I use the law of God, it's to show someone you aren't sexually pure. You aren't um, honest and truthful. You do worship idolatrous things in your heart. And you expose them to the law of God so that they stand condemned, uh, that the wrath of God abides on them. And then you say, but Christ Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law have trust and faith in him, and the wrath that's on you uh, has been poured out on him, okay? So you are free from that, that that bondage. And additionally, when you have trust and faith in him, he transforms your nature uh, so that you don't have to like try and work real hard not to be sexually immoral. But as you have trust and faith and live in confession and live in repentance, Christ changes your nature nature. This is, again, a doctrine of faith and repentance. This is a doctrine of uh, penal substitution. Um, so so to, for her to say that any exercise of the law or for someone to look at the Bible and it says, I do not permit a woman to teach, preach, or exercise authority over a man, and for someone to read it and say, well, I'm not going to interpret it. I'm just going to read it. And it says that clearly. I'm just going to believe it. To assume that any blind following of God's commands and precepts is somehow um, a religious spirit or religion and not to be followed is by definition antinomian, which means that we deny the use of the law in the New Testament. Uh, and that is not at all what we are to do as New Testament believers when it comes to the law. And I've rambled so long. Does someone want to tag in? And sure. get you fired okay. up too. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, man, no, when you get to antinomian it's... stuff, it's just like, no, don't do it. Yeah, antinomian meaning basically lawlessness is basically what it is. So, right, right. Uh, Josh, I like what you said there about like, hey, law still applies we, as long as we use it lawfully. And uh, and so uh, there is a place for it. And um, and so we've done episodes about that. Uh, you know, I'll, I'm just going to say this. It's not necessarily on the subject of the religious spirit. I would personally not have a problem for, with preaching from John chapter eight and that portion of the manuscript. Uh, if I did, I would just say, Pagan. you know what, this one's, this portion is a little bit debated and here's why I would address it for a moment. But, you know, there is a debate over, you know, sometimes the earliest manuscript might not necessarily be the most accurate, uh, manuscript, because if you have say, a fourth generation sloppily of sloppy manuscript copiers versus an eighth generation of really meticulous manuscript copiers. Well, that one would actually be more accurate than the fourth generation. My point is we don't know for sure. I think a strong case could be made that it shouldn't be included in a strong case. It, the fact that it's in our Bibles, a lot of the uh, conservative interpreters uh, think that it does have a place there. Uh, and, and however, you... there is always a footnote. However, I would say I would just speak to that and say, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but, um, you know, I, I would feel comfortable with it, but that's, I don't want to get into textual criticism too much. Cause we, we that's not really the I was so episode. curious right now. It's, it's worth, so it's worth curious. saying though, that just, the majority of scholarship says that this is a later textual variant, right? Like the majority of scholarship. They will say it's that. later. They will right. not necessarily say, I wouldn't say that the majority of interpreters assert this shouldn't be in our Bibles. Because I think if that was have, true, have, they wouldn't put it in our Bibles. This is a rabbit trail. I think Just a little bit. I, it, it's a back total to rabbit trail. It's a total. This is a I, theology I podcast. Say, We're nerds. <laughs> I mean, it's like I, a religious spirit. That I'm just saying, with. hey, I, I don't want some pastor out there who's about to preach through John 8 next week to be like, well, I can't preach it. I, I would say, do your research, seek the Holy Spirit, and then make your decision. And then we show you that say. it's and not I think, original autographs. I would, no, I'm just I think Josh. Keep going. I'm just kidding. And if you, and if you <laughs> think that it is, you bro. have a religious spirit. No, I'm just <laughs> yes. I'm just yes. kidding. Guys. Okay. 
So uh, anyway, I did like what Leclerc said about, hey, don't go out on witch hunt. Uh, pray. What you really need to do is pray. And so if you actually follow her advice on this, she's against hypocrisy and, and so on, then, you know, it's not going to lead you to this like terrible place. Like, hey, I, I want us to all pray. So I'm, I'm not saying she's not saying anything heretical. Um, but I, I think that it is time for us to draw our conclusions about whether or not there is a religious spirit. So I can make I, I can start that or one of you can. Uh, Miller, but we haven't heard from you in a while. Maybe we can each do a closing thought on is there or isn't there a religious spirit? Miller, why don't we start with you? Uh, I think there are there is a demonic spirit out there that's trying to add burdens on people's shoulders that they were never meant to bear. I think there is a demonic spirit out there that is uh, uh, for sure living in hypocrisy and wants people to uh, put burdens on others that they themselves would not bear. Um, and could that spirit, that demonic spirit, be a religious spirit, be, a, be tasked specifically with targeting religious leaders or getting people to fall into forms or patterns and forget the God behind those forms? Um, you want to call it a religious spirit? Cool. I'm down with that. Uh, I cannot definitively say yes, um, but I definitely think there is demonic power. I can definitively say yes to that. <laughs> You're muted, buddy. Still <laughs> muted. <laughs> You're the one who put the camera on me when I wasn't ready. So um, <laughs> got to keep him on his toes. <laughs> If I was to make a case that there was such a thing as a religious spirit, and I'm I'm sympathetic, Jack Deere teaches on the religious spirit and uh, says the religious spirit, you know, uh, actually, uh, Miller, do you have the quote from Jack uh, about the religious spirit? Yeah, let me pull that up for you. Uh, to the very bottom of my notes. Let's see. Jack Deere says the religious spirit, it's demonic, and it attempts to substitute a demonic power or a fleshly power for the power of the Holy Spirit. And the religious spirit is more concerned with what we look like than what we really are. Okay. So, uh, so here is a longtime mentor and spiritual father to me, basically teaching on the religious spirit. Uh, so definitely Jack's not a heretic for, for asserting that or teaching that not by a, a long shot. Um, Personally, I'm not going to teach that there is such a thing as a religious spirit for the for the reason that I, I can't point to it in the scripture. And uh, and I think, too, I probably have a little more of an aversion to it because I see uh, so many charismatic teachers saying, well, there's a religious spirit. There's a Python spirit. There's a Leviathan spirit. There's a Jezebel spirit. There's a this spirit. There's a that spirit. Everything is a, is a spirit of something. I mean, this is probably way TMI, but if you use the restroom next to Josh, he's going to say the spirit of release is upon him. <laughs> um, that yeah, is sometimes Josh. I'll say the spirit of release is upon you, depending <laughs> on what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> but I know this is way too you far, and I completely that. digressed. But you know, you're you right under the bus. Later. I could have played it off like, "What are you talking about?" It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what you're doing? You're actually kind of making light of this is a thing in charismaticism that it's like literally oh, yeah. in the most menial of of situations and tasks and whatever you want to call going to the bathroom. It's like there's a spirit of everything. And I just kind of want to avoid that. I, I don't know that there's a spirit of everything. We we have in the scripture, there's a, a, a mute spirit. There is a deaf spirit. There is the devil. Spirit um, of infirmity. In the Old Testament. Yeah, there's a, there's a spirit and infirmity in the Old Testament. There's a lying spirit. So there are these different kinds of spirits. But I just don't want to get into teaching a bunch of things that I can't really point to in the Bible. So I just try to stay away from it. Now, here's what I would say. If I was to make a point that there was such a thing as a spirit of religion, I would make the point by saying, like, hey, what the Pharisees did was sin. And the devil is the one motivating that sin and demons are the ones motivating that sin. So certainly there's a spirit of such and such, just like there's probably a spirit of lust and a spirit of hate and a spirit of racism. Then surely there's a spirit of, uh, of religion. That might be one argument I make. Another argument I make might be that uh, maybe to look at Jesus and uh, when he was uh, being tempted in uh in the wilderness and, and the devil comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, turn these stones to bread. If you're the son of God, jump off from this temple. 
And uh, fast forward to when Jesus is dying on the cross and Jesus' human accusers say, if you're the son of God, save yourself. If you're the son of God, get down from there. And so you, what you see is Jesus' accusers are echoing the original accuser, the devil. And, uh, and so I might point to that and say, well, clearly they were demonically sourced. And so this is a spirit. One last argument I might make would be uh, it is long perplexed in uh, biblical scholars why there are no exorcisms in the book of John. Uh, there are loads of exorcisms in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but John has none. And uh, some people posit that the reason for that, now there are a number of theories, read a whole research paper on it today, uh, but uh one of the theories is that the the real enemy of uh, in the Gospel of John is not so much the demons, but actual people who are inspired by these demons, parentheses. So I would maybe kind of argue in those kinds of ways if I was to say there was such a thing as a religious spirit. But to me, those arguments are not definitive enough. I would just stay away from that language and I would say, well, don't be like the Pharisees because it's bad because they do these things. To me, that's what the Bible says. And that's enough for me. That's enough for me to motivate people away from um, the beha uh, sinful behavior and toward holiness. And that's what I want to do. So I would stay away from that language personally. Well, you told me to draw it out. So I did. Uh, I'll say no, no, there's not a religious spirit. That was my <laughs> joke there. Um, I was doodling as you were talking. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna appeal to a comment from Dawson in the the comment section. DJ uh, Dawson makes a really good point that you create when you start using religious language uh, of the us and the them. And what happens is when you acknowledge that someone has a religious spirit, you can mark them off as someone not to, um, not to consider a brother or sister in Christ. Right. So like Ephesians four yeah. three tells us to like strive for unity in the bond of peace. And then Ephesians 4, I think 16 through 22, tells us that when the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, if we equip the saying, it's right, it's to build us up until we reach the fullness of the faith and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, so in Ephesians 4, 3, he tells us to fight for unity, right? And then later on, he tells us that that unity is both in faith and in knowledge of Jesus. So if you are disagreeing with someone about Jesus and you find that they have a religious spirit, are you really going to strive and work with a person that you disagree with? Are you going to strive for the bond of peace? I've seen this happen a great, great uh, multitude of times where uh, an individual will say, hey, that person's got a Jezebel spirit. And then what will happen is they'll, we'll protect all of our husbands and children and we'll, we'll move people. And when I say husbands, let's be very clear here. Uh, I am talking about individuals in the church who are trying to rescue their husbands. Uh, I have a wife. Okay, so uh, uh, also the law is good for that distinction as well. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, so so we will, what will happen is we'll, we'll create a, a self-fulfilling prophecy where those guys are mean, those guys are angry, they have a religious spirit. So we're not going to strive for unity. We're not going to love them well. We're not going to contend in doctrine and theology with these individuals. And what happens is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The only people those individuals get exposed to are the hyper-charismatic, angry people, uh, and, and they never see the thoughtful continuationists, the careful continuationists. So what would happen if charismatic individuals, you know, strive for the bond of peace, Peeth, man, I'm using a lot of fun, funny words today with both charismatics and cessationists and said, hey, guys, uh, there is a need for unity here. And I think that we can't demonize people by attributing to them some kind of religious spirit. So uh, no is is my answer. We shouldn't do it. I think it creates an us and them category that's not helpful. Uh, I don't usually am the guy who does the closing thoughts last, uh, but since we're ready to wrap up the show, is there anything else that you guys want to? Jump in there and, and say. I think I said my piece. Man. Religion closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. What'd you say, Miller? Miller, you can't speak, bro. Josh, pull the graphic up. Pull the graphic up. Oh, yeah. I was about to <laughs> do that. Just as a reminder, Show. as we close, everyone, this is the image of the religious spirit. Uh, in case you didn't catch it earlier, uh, Jack Deere, who said that there is a religious spirit, he believes that this is what it looks like. He caught it on footage. <laughs> That has not been edited. It has not been worked on by anyone that we are aware of. Nobody. Uh, at, no. at all. That was the exact image that he sent us. Anyway, without further ado, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. Uh, there are links in the descriptions. If you like this video and other videos and you want to support us, you can give on PayPal. It's a one-time gift or on Patreon. 
as a reoccurring giver as low as five bucks a month there on Patreon. Uh, and uh, we've got a free ebook there on the the description called Though Man May Not Perceive It, Ways to Hear God's Voice. If you want to hear God's voice in the different ways that God speaks that you might not be able to hear, that'd be a good book for you. Uh, lots of great content found there. Without further ado, guys, I will see you next week, Monday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Blessings.